Plants and animals have been adapting to their environments for millions of years. Species have survived by adjusting to the climate, finding food, and avoiding danger in their immediate surroundings. Organisms do not live in isolation. They live within ecosystems. An ecosystem is a habitat in which plants, animals, and microorganisms interact with each other and their non-living surroundings. Ponds, beaches, fields, and forests are ecosystems. An ecosystem includes the biotic, or living components, and the abiotic, or non-living components. The living organisms in an ecosystem are known as its biota. Together, the biota make up a community. For a species to survive, it must have a niche in the community where it can find food necessary for its survival and reproduction. In every ecosystem are two types of organisms, producers and consumers. The producers, called autotrophs, produce their own food. Photosynthesizing plants and some microorganisms are autotrophs. Consumers are called heterotrophs. Herbivores eat plants only, and they are primary consumers. Carnivores are secondary consumers. They eat meat and live off primary consumers. The consumer's fungi and bacteria are also called decomposers because they eat dead and decaying organisms. They break down grass, tree trunks, and animal remains so that nutrients return to the soil. The producers, consumers, secondary consumers, and decomposers make up an interdependent community within an ecosystem. One way they interrelate is through the food web. The food web has many overlapping food chains of producers and consumers. For example, on the African plain, producers such as grass grow in abundance. Herbivores, such as antelope, eat the grass. Carnivores, such as lions, kill and eat part of the antelope. Jackals eat other parts of the remains. Worms, ants, and bacteria consume what is left. Since most species eat and are eaten by more than one other species, food chains link together in a food web. And changes affecting one group ultimately affect several others. Food chains exist in all ecosystems. Many cycles also take place within the abiotic, or non-living components, of an ecosystem. First, the producers use sunlight to produce or make food, which provides or supplies them with energy. Then it passes along the food chain to consumers, the herbivores, carnivores, and decomposers. The different feeding, or trophic levels, form an energy pyramid. As the energy passes from level to level, less and less of the original energy captured by producers is available to organisms at the higher levels. Biologists estimate that about 10% of the energy in one trophic level is transferred to the next trophic level, and so on. Where does the rest go? Some is used for digestion, work, growth, and reproduction, and the rest gets dissipated as heat. When the energy is passed to the next trophic level, such as from the herbivore that eats the plant to the carnivore that eats the herbivore, only 1% of the original energy is available. At each trophic level is a decrease of about 90% of available energy. Despite this reduction, an ecosystem sustains itself because the biomass, or number of organisms, at each trophic level is also reduced by at least 90 percent. 
The biomass at the bottom level is so great and it replenishes itself so quickly that it can sustain the organisms at the higher levels. While energy flows through an ecosystem, other substances get recycled and are not lost. Necessary for all living organisms, water is constantly recycled. It may lie in a lake before flowing into the sea. It may evaporate into the atmosphere to become water vapor before the wind blows it away and it falls as rain. Water can remain in the soil before a plant absorbs it. Water is constantly being recycled through ecosystems and the entire biosphere. The biosphere is any part of the earth that supports life and includes the land, air, and water. The carbon cycle is based on carbon dioxide, or CO2, but it's very similar to the energy flow. Plants use carbon dioxide to make food. Animals eat the plants and absorb some of the carbon into their bodies. Animals release the carbon into the air through a process called respiration, and the process begins again. Carbon is also trapped in the fossil fuels oil and coal. When burned, the fuels release the carbon into the atmosphere. Over time, carbon dioxide has built up in the atmosphere to produce what scientists call the greenhouse effect. Some scientists believe too much buildup is causing global warming, which can lead to climate change and severe weather. Ecosystems can be overwhelmed by heavy concentrations of any element entering it. For example, nitrogen makes up 78% of the Earth's atmosphere, but very small amounts are in the oceans, soil, and organisms. Plants, bacteria, and decomposers recycle it. In recent years, farmers have added large amounts of nitrogen fertilizer to soils to improve crop production. This practice has increased the acidity of soils and the pollution of waterways. Phosphorus is also a required nutrient for plants, and like nitrogen, farmers have added it to fertilizer. Runoff from farmland containing nitrogen and phosphorus overstimulates the growth of algae in bodies of water, depleting the oxygen and suffocating the aquatic life. Did you know? Fertilizers containing nitrogen and phosphorus flowing down the Mississippi River into the Gulf of Mexico have created a yearly dead zone. Its oxygen level is so low that fish and other organisms cannot survive. This dead zone is roughly the size of New Jersey. Predators and prey are in a constant battle for survival, and sometimes predators compete with other predators. Sharks are superior hunters of the deep. Humans value the same prey the sharks depend on. This competition can have serious effects on the survival of sharks and other fish. All organisms in an ecosystem engage in constant interaction, and competition for scarce resources is often greatest between organisms that get their food in similar ways. Trees push their branches high into the crown of the forest cover to reach the sunlight essential for photosynthesis. At the same time, they send their roots deep into the ground to get water and minerals. Those trees that cannot get enough of these essentials will die. Similarly, sharks in the ocean compete for food with other sharks and fish-eating species like whales, octopus, and even humans. In an ecosystem with scarce resources, the more efficient or stronger species will survive. Coyotes will drive out or eliminate foxes when they compete for the same resources. And wolves will drive out coyotes. This process is competitive exclusion. Predation describes the relationship between consumers and the organisms they eat. The most obvious example is carnivores killing and eating their prey. But herbivores eating plants engage in another form of predation. A cyclical relationship often exists between predators and prey. 
When the number of animals in a prey population increases, the number of predators usually increases as well. And when the prey population decreases, so does the number of predators. When drought in the African savanna reduces the population of grasses and herbivores, the number of leopards decreases because they can't find enough food to survive. When the relationship between predator and prey changes, serious problems may arise. When cougars were eliminated in the American Southwest because they killed domestic animals, the deer population rapidly grew. In time, overgrazing by the deer brought about soil erosion and the lack of food led to their starvation. Cougars have been reintroduced since and the deer population has been reduced. Some organisms have developed fascinating ways to avoid being prey. Cacti and thistles have spikes and thorns. Porcupines have quills. Turtles have shells, and rhinos have a tough armor-like layer of skin. Camouflage is another tactic. Some insects mimic their surroundings so well, they seem to disappear. A chameleon skin color changes, allowing it to blend into the surrounding leaves and trees. In many ecosystems, when one species relies on another for survival, but the second species is not affected. This is called commensalism. Barnacles attach themselves to whales. This gives the barnacles protection and lets them reach new sources of food. However, the barnacles do not help or harm the whale. Two species benefiting from a close relationship is mutualism. The oxpecker perches on a cape buffalo to eat the insects it attracts. Bees and hummingbirds feeding on the nectar from plants also help pollinate other plants. An organism living off of and harming another is parasitism. Many fungi and bacteria are parasites. Fleas thrive on the blood of animals. And roundworms can live in the human digestive tract. Interdependence between species can be beneficial, neutral, or deadly. No matter the outcome, it is unavoidable. Did you know? All organisms in an ecosystem affect other organisms, and this includes humans. Puppies are great pets, but they can carry roundworms that spread to people. Roundworms usually infect the intestinal tract and occasionally block it. An adult roundworm can grow more than one foot long. Communities of organisms in an ecosystem constantly change to meet new environmental conditions, climactic changes, or the sudden arrival of a new species. Humans constantly affect the world's ecosystems. The changes may be minimal or dramatic, sometimes negative and other times positive. Change is a constant in any ecosystem, and sometimes it is very dramatic. After a volcano erupts, barren rocks fill the landscape. Soon after, plants start to invade. Gradually, other plants grow, and animals move in because there is enough food to sustain them. This type of secession happens on land and in aquatic environments. Many northern lakes in North America formed when glaciers retreated about 10,000 years ago. At first, the lakes supported almost no life. Then reeds and bulrushes began to grow by their shores. The water slowly became rich in nutrients, attracting algae and invertebrates. Fish began to live there, along with ducks, amphibians, herons, and other carnivores. Ecosystems such as this can exist for many years, even centuries. But often, lakes silt up and become swamps and marshes with a different ecosystem and its own community of organisms. 
Secession in any ecosystem follows cycles of regeneration and change. A forest fire can replace a mature forest with young trees, followed by new populations of birds and insects. As the forest matures, different species of trees dominate while others decline. The cycle continues until another fire begins the process again. Human activity influences almost all local ecosystems. And because they are interconnected, the overall effect is global. If ecosystems are to remain healthy, they must maintain a rich diversity of living organisms. The biodiversity of ecosystems around the world is currently undergoing dramatic changes as a result of human intervention. The human population is exploding in many parts of the globe. Agriculture is extending onto the most marginal lands. Air and water pollution has become so extensive that no part of the planet is unaffected. A recent study by the United Nations Environment Program states that the world's forests are vanishing at an alarming rate. Just 21% of the Earth's land area is covered with healthy forests, and scientists fear that the richest patches of the remaining forests could vanish within decades. This will have serious consequences for soil erosion and the ability of plants to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Chemical runoff from farmland and the dumping of untreated sewage are destroying coral reefs. The algae that thrive on these nutrients smother the reefs and damage the ecosystem. The consequences of human influences threaten the biodiversity of ecosystems. The alarming decline in the variety of species and the number of individuals within some species has many biologists afraid that we are in the midst of another mass extermination. But unlike those in the past, this one is the result of human destruction. The loss of biodiversity is a serious issue for the 21st century. Only humans can save the world's ecosystems and the many organisms that thrive within them. If there is a distinctive image that reflects the vitality of our Earth, a single symbol of life, it is the tree. To enter the world of trees is to enter a complex world of mystery and beauty. We will enter that world to celebrate the realm of the forest, the kingdom of the tree. Trees, hickory, hemlock, cottonwood, oak. Their names echo softly through our minds. These old companions that walk the seasons of a lifetime. Our world would not be the same without them. Yet most of us know little of their lives, their history, their being. Trees are among the tallest, the largest, and the oldest living things on Earth. Trees nurture our spirit, provide sustenance, sanctuary, and shelter.
No other form of life affects the rhythm of our lives more than trees. The great forests of Earth veil our planet with a living tapestry, a tapestry vital to our very existence. There's one place on Earth where the trees have more to say than anywhere else. In a remote mountain range of California lives a tree that has warmed to the rising of the sun more than a million times. This is the realm of the ancient bristlecone pine. These isolated groves contain living trees more than 4,000 years old. Standing defiantly, the remains of trees born nearly 7,000 years ago mark the landscape. The oldest of these symbols of life sprang forth from the rocky soils as the Great Sphinx took shape in ancient Egypt. Even today, this forest remains vibrant and alive. Young seedlings venture forth to share this brutal terrain with their ancient siblings. Throughout most of recorded history, the boughs of these long-lasting survivors have bent to the winds of time. Sculpted by the winds of 40 centuries, these tenacious trees are a symbol of resilience and beauty. The bristlecone pine embodies the strength and dignity of all trees. Standing twisted, yet stately, these sentinels of time have survived to become some of the oldest known living things on Earth. are much more than great collections of trees. They are complex fabricators of the basic elements of life. Energized by the sun, trees convert air, water, and other nutrients into living matter. Forests replenish the Earth's atmosphere. Simply, forests create fresh air. One forest that affects our atmosphere is the great old growth stands of North America. There isn't any ecosystem in the whole world that stores more carbon than our northwestern coniferous forests. They're just giant storehouses of the stuff uh, in the trees, in the logs, in the forest floor, and down in the soil. Jerry Franklin studies old growth forests. These primal forests are dominated by the evergreens, Douglas fir and western hemlock. Dr. Franklin's 35 years of research has changed our basic understanding of how forests work. There's a big old Douglas fir tree here. Uh, this tree is Oh, about six feet in diameter, probably around 250 feet tall. And uh, it's probably about 500 years old. A living tree like this provides a lot of different functions in the forest. It provides a home for a lot of different kinds of organisms. It's doing a lot of productivity. It's doing a lot of photosynthesis, so it's a source of energy for the ecosystem. One of the interesting things about the big old tree is, of course, eventually it dies. And what we find is that uh, a tree, when it dies in one of these ecosystems, probably has as many functions to fulfill in the, in the dead form as it did in the live form. 
In the pristine old growth forests of North America, one finds the remains of dead trees covering much of the forest floor. These downed logs return vital nutrients to the soil, completing a cycle that for some began a thousand years ago. One of the very important functions of these standing dead trees is the wildlife habitat that they provide. And you can see uh, in this tree that there's been a lot of, of uh, birds, uh, woodpeckers of some kind working, excavating parts of this tree in their search for food. Food is a driving force for every member of the forest community. One of the beauties of a natural forest is its heterogeneity. It's a very, uh, in many senses, a very chaotic rather than a, a manicured kind of system. And what makes a forest work, in fact, is some of that disorder, some of that chaos. citizens of the forest accept their surroundings as given. Their struggle to survive leaves little time to appreciate what we might consider gifts from the forest. For many of us, our connection to the forest has become distant at best. Often our only memories of the forest live in objects made from wood. from the forest come not only in the form of crafted wood. The food we eat, the air we breathe, and the renewal of our very spirit often depends on a forest or a tree. A forest offering can sometimes take a most unusual form. Look at that. The fiddleback pattern is, is the strongest right in the butt of the tree, and this is the, the very butt of the tree. Bruce Harvey combs the Pacific Northwest really? and travels the world in search of the finest and rarest tone of woods. It'll show up really nice in the back of a violin or a viola. This is going to be viola wood. Every tree is very singular and very unique. We don't cut trees. There's no need to cut trees. There's enough trees falling down for us to work with. There's a real awareness among instrument makers of the depletion of the resource. Yeah, these are going to look great under a varnish. Nice white maple. It's usually at this early stage of shaping the arch that I get a sense of what kind of material I'm working with. Get a feel for the hardness of the wood and what kind of acoustical properties it might have and make a lot of decisions at this stage in, in the final shape of the arch. After aging five to ten years, some of Bruce Harvey's tone wood finds its way to the workshop of Thomas Crone. Tom has handcrafted concert quality violins and violas for many years. This piece of wood is a, is a very nice piece of spruce. It's quite old and it has all the factors that I'm looking for. Good strength and flexibility and it's lightweight. We use such a small portion of, of the tree. A friend of mine said, it's the filet mignon of the tree. <laughs> Now I'm making a tool that somebody else is going to use to make music with. And uh, it's a great feeling to hear an instrument that you've made played.
gifts from the forest lured many early settlers to North America. They saw the great American forest as limitless, and they paid little heed to the path of destruction left behind in their frenetic drive west. The tallest and straightest trees were the first to be cut down. These trees sailed the seas as the masts of the merchantmen and ships of war. Many of the eastern forests were cleared for farmland. Beyond the needs of agriculture was an endless appetite for firewood. An area more than 200,000 square miles soon fell to the axe. Farming continued to consume millions of acres of America's virgin forests. Railroads devoured timber for track ties. As the great American frontier expanded, cities and towns consumed much of the woodlands as well. Steady growth continued until the depression in the 1930s. When demand rebounded during the post-war boom years, loggers began to rely on a newer and more destructive method of harvest, clear cutting. From a forestry standpoint, from the standpoint of wood production, it's probably a very effective one at getting new forest back that will grow uh, very rapidly and produce a lot of wood fiber. It's the only practice we've used in any significant amount. In the face of clear cutting, Dr. Franklin is concerned about maintaining the forest as habitat, watershed, and a source of fresh air. How to balance the continuing need for lumber and timberland jobs with environmental values has been a challenging question. I was raised in this country and my dad was a worker in a pulp and paper mill. What happened during my dad's life was that he saw a, a major change occur from uh, the early days when these forests seemed to be pretty much an inexhaustible resource to, in the last couple decades, a realization that almost all of these natural forests are going to be cut down unless we change what we're doing. And even though his whole livelihood was the wood products industry, he came to be a, a strong supporter of both uh, maintaining some of the old growth and of altering forest practices so as to maintain more of those values even on the commodity or cutover lands. Loggers in our society were once regarded as heroes, the very men who helped build America. In the timber towns of the Northwest, loggers are still revered by many. Controversy over the harvest of great forests is not new. One hundred years ago, America's magnificent giant sequoias commonly fell to the woodman's axe. Over one-third of all the sequoia groves were logged. It is possible that the greatest of all these great trees was lost only to end its days as a grape stake or roof shingle. Most sequoias are now protected, and today this great tree is recognized as one of the largest living things on Earth. Imagination often leads us to special forests. Forests that have been set aside in an attempt to preserve some last vestige of pristine nature. These sanctuaries have become America's national parks. Embodied in these preserves is the beauty of our broad land.
While only a few of America's great parks can rightly be called wilderness, each in its own way offers a glimpse of an essential and primal vision of our Earth. Trees stand at the very heart of that vision. Here in the Everglades, the forest seems born of the ocean. Nowhere else in North America does the land slope so gently to the sea. A shallow meandering flow of water travels this broad flat land, which less than 5,000 years ago laid beneath the ocean. Dominating the Everglades are vast open sawgrass prairies, where critical water flow affects the seasonal cadence of this enchanted land. The animals and plants have adapted to this ever-changing wetland. The trees here reveal a variety unmatched anywhere in North America. Connected to the Everglades on the northwest is the Big Cypress Swamp. Cypress trees dominate here, where the forest seems endless and impenetrable. Surrounding the seaward edge of the glades are the mangroves. Anchored firmly beneath the brackish flow, mangroves provide a nursery for the aquatic life that nourishes the Everglades' complex system. Humans have greatly altered the natural circulation of water here in the Everglades. In spite of the changes, a sparkling diversity remains. diversity of the Everglades and Big Cypress stirs the imagination. Enchanted by its mystery is wildlife biologist John Ogden. It's a system that's hard to come to know. It's, it looks simple, it's flat, and yet the complexity of the old natural Everglades is, is so exciting. It's, it's a thing of beauty. It's, it's a remarkable story of the way nature works. And coming to understand the system and the complexity of it just increases the wonder and the amazement and the, the love for the place. As park biologist, John Ogden must manage an endless list of administrative tasks. Like many of us, he tries to balance his official responsibilities with personal time, time spent in an environment he loves. I've spent far, far more time during these 25 years in meetings, in conferences, in dealing with the issues than I have out in the country. But I have spent a great deal of time in the Everglades. I've spent many nights, thousands of days out in this wetland, and those are the memories that I carry around. The meetings all run together in a blur, and what we accomplish at each meeting sometimes seems infinitesimal. And so I tend to forget those. But crystal clear in my mind are days that I first went into big rookeries in the 1960s, when I first encountered a crocodile on a trail in a dense hardwood hammock, sleeping in a hammock in the middle of the Everglades, surrounded by a million mosquitoes in the middle of the night, all looking for a crack in the mosquito netting. These are the memories I have, and this is the Everglades. On the other side of our continent stands a forest like no other. Born of sand and stone, the saguaro forest lives in the great Sonoran Desert. Thank you. Thank you. 
Danny Lopez is a storyteller of the Tohono O'odham Nation, people who have made their home in this uncompromising saguaro forest. According to legend, the giant saguaro cactus sprang forth from the tears of a child forsaken by her mother. Whatever its origin, the saguaro is a cactus become tree. The forest community here is varied and surprising. Animals of every description live within the giant saguaro stands, balanced precariously in a demanding terrain. When undisturbed, the great saguaro can live nearly 300 years. The greatest challenge facing these silent sentinels may not come from the saguaro's harsh environment. As desert cities expand, these great trees face an uncertain future. For me, I would be just like uh, losing someone in my family because it's something we're so used to. We ask for well-being, for strength. Uh, if we couldn't do that uh, and we couldn't see our person, uh, I, would be, uh, I would be very saddened uh, if that ever happened in my lifetime. In the forest, winter is a time of silent storm and stark beauty. Winter is also a time of stress and challenge. Winter in the forest is a way of ensuring the survival of only those who persevere. Storms in the forest are not exclusive to winter. New forests are often born of cataclysmic events. The trauma of fire is part of the rhythm, renewal, and rebirth of the forest. Even though fire is a natural process, many feel the loss of any forest is a difficult loss. One of our great American forests lived through such a loss. Yellowstone received a jolt of prehistoric proportions in, in 1988. Uh, certainly, the fires uh, disrupted uh, social, social and economic factors, but, uh, but ecologically, nothing bad went on here. Nothing good. It just was. John Varley experienced the Yellowstone fires as chief of research for the National Park. Today, the natural mosaic of Yellowstone has greatly changed. The forests of Yellowstone are the very fabric that adorns what may be the greatest natural wonder in America. Yellowstone National Park was created in 1872. This unique natural wonder became the first fully recognized national park on Earth. Today, no other wild place on our continent symbolizes more fully America's love of wilderness. Yellowstone and the remaining preserves in America are rare jewels in a crown of natural beauty, a shining symbol of a nation's affinity for nature. Forests can have special meaning in the life of an individual. Visiting and revisiting a forest adds continuity to our life. Those first footsteps taken down a particular forest path echo throughout a lifetime. What is seen, what is felt, what is heard among the trees can make a person whole. When I go back into the, uh, the back country of Yellowstone, away from the roads and the boardwalks and so forth, I see it as, as, as going into a temple. 
This is such a special place for those of us who live here, for those of us who come back and, and visit it on a regular basis. It's a feeling like we would have if we walked into the Sistine Chapel. The emotions aroused in us by trees are as natural as the trees themselves. Trees, even younger ones, become symbols of resilience and strength. Trees are one of the few forms of life that often outlive us. And as a result, those of us who are truly aware of trees stand in awe. A different legacy can be found scattered throughout America's southeast, the hardwood forest. One special hardwood forest stands on the edge of a teeming metropolis. Surprisingly, it thrives and is home to a variety of plants and animals. Familiar with this unique forest is botanist Roger Hammer. I look at these hardwood forests today as being much more than a refuge for wildlife, they are very much a refuge for the human spirit, where the city weary can come and enjoy this uplifting of spirit that comes with being close to nature in these forests. To understand the relationships that exist in a forest and in all of nature is to recognize that every species plays an important part in keeping our world alive and well. These things were here first, and they're being endangered by us. And if we can help them maintain their existence here, I think that's basically what it's all about. I've supported groups that help save polar bears, and I don't ever plan on seeing a polar bear in the wild because I live in South Florida. I guess it's just because I'm glad they're there. years ago, European settlers, axes in hand, pondered a virgin forest that stretched from the east coast to the great Mississippi. Today, less than 6% of all America's original forests survive. Worldwide, the overharvest of trees continues to claim endless acres of forest each year. And with each passing day, we have sadly far less to celebrate. The life of a tree seems simple. It spends the days and years seemingly oblivious to what passes before it. Yet each tree profoundly affects every corner of the earth as it nurtures an atmosphere shared by every living creature. A growing appreciation for the critical role of trees in our world may alter what seems to be an increasingly uncertain future. To be pessimistic is to miss the point. Our forests, our trees, our wondrous treasures and America is blessed with some of the greatest forests on Earth. If our fragile planet is to survive, we must celebrate and cherish the realm of the forest, the kingdom of the tree.